Hey everyone, sorry for the delay, some technical difficulties. Uh, my name is Benson Fox. I am a certified life coach and PsyD candidate. Um, what we're going to talk about here today is Torah and therapy, two words that generally don't go, people don't associate um, together. So I think that when we're thinking about the Torah and therapy, people see there's mental health and there's like religious, you know? Um, I think the first thing that we should talk about is that really everything starts with Torah, right? Everything we're doing is supposed to fulfilling Hashem's will in this world. Um, the Torah is the context for everything that we do. Um, and in that, in, that includes our mental health, you know, which we address, our, our deep psychic wounds, the traumas, etc., through a process called therapy to, to make ourselves more functional, to make ourselves healthier people. So number one, I would just say that the Torah comes first, obviously, and the Torah is something that we should prioritize and everything falls in the context of that. But let's move on from this point. Next point I want to mention about Torah and therapy is that not, it's not just the context, but there is a sense that the Torah already assumes a, a high degree of mental health. And let me give you a few examples of this. Um, one example is that it says, the Torah says, Va'ahavta l'reacha kamochi, you should love your friend as yourself. Um, the Torah is not giving a, um, a qualifier, right? It's not saying, you know, if you only love him as much as you love yourself. It's saying that you should love someone to this climax, to this, you know, the highest possible level of, of love, which is self-love. And it's assuming that you have this high degree of self-love, that you do prioritize and love yourself above all else. And then saying, oh yes, and establish that same exceptionally high standard to everyone else. And, and in halacha, there is no exception that we say, um, for someone that is not a someone who's a who does not love themselves, you're still completely obligated to love your neighbor. So that's one example, but there are many others, many other examples. Um, you find many commentators discuss ha- that in order to learn Torah, you have to be a certain baseline level of joy. You find that the commentators discuss how a person is meant to when they're facing. Um, um, adversity, right? This daigos beloved ishi sichana. That when you're facing anxieties, you're meant to um, share them with the world, and that's not some. That's something that again, the Torah is assumes that's something that you would do. That if you had something on your mind, you would share it. Some people don't do that when they're faced with anxieties, etc. They they keep it all in and to their very much detriment. Um, the Torah also assumes that you'll have friends, right? Kamocha, that you'll have reim, that you'll have ahuvim. It, it assumes much. Um, within us, it also assumes you'll have a muna. It assumes, right? According to the Ramban or Rambam, he said they say that, that the mitzvah of a muna, having faith in Hashem, is not a its own its own commandment. It is something that is a you know it was just assumed by the Torah. So I would say that mental health, in a large degree, is that there the Torah is meant to take someone who has a certain baseline of mental health, a certain baseline level of healthiness, and elevate them and refine them to a to a transcendent level, to take someone and make them into something that is even greater than an angel, something that's even um, exceptionally high, high degree of character, of conscientiousness, um, of balance. But the point is you need to start with that baseline. And sometimes when people are entering therapy, sometimes it's just to boost their self-awareness, um, to become, you know, optimize their lives. But for most of us that, that join therapy, it is to establish that baseline. And I think that that would then come before the Torah. The Torah was assuming that when it's giving its commandments, right? That it's saying all these things for someone that has this baseline level of joy, baseline level of self-esteem, baseline level of self-love. So I think one other really important point we're discussing Torah and mental health is is that Torah and mental health are not two things that are so, um, right, to just review um, right, one point we're mentioning is how the Torah mental health, the, the mental health falls into the context of the Torah. We're also mentioning how the Torah makes a lot of assumptions about w- what our mental health is. So it has to have a certain baseline. But also the Torah contributes to a person's mental health. And let's, I'll give you a few examples of where we see this. You know, first of all, there are many studies. I'm actually writing my, I'm, I'm also a psychology doctoral candidate. I'm writing my dissertation on religious resilience. So this is kind of my thing, this, this topic. But how a person's level of spirituality, religiosity, contributes to their ability to withstand adversity, to cope and overcome, you know, suffering in their lives. And not only that, to come out on the other end of it, of another term that people are not as familiar with, it's called post-traumatic growth. 
And actually, mo- many more people experience post-traumatic growth, which is that they perceive that they have experienced benefits from having gone through something than those who experience a disorder, a post-traumatic stress disorder from it. According to the American Psychology Association, only about, I think, 3 to 5% of people who go through um, trauma um, that they end up with getting post-traumatic stress disorder. And as opposed to about 50 to 80% estimated amount of people that they, that they get have their stress and, and trauma, I'm um, sorry, that they, that they get, get receive benefits from what they're going through. So let's just go through a few examples of where we see this in Judaism. So one, one example, I mean, Orthodox Judaism. One example is that if you're davening every day, you say a hundred brachos, right? You say a hundred brachos, you're expressing gratitude. You're thinking of positivity. Um, if you're, you have humility, right? You bow to God, you bow to, other, you know, you, um, you have, you love your neighbor. You're connected with your community. You're going to synagogue three days, three times a day, at least for a man. Um, that creates a sense of community. And on Shabbos, you have mourning, you know, there are ways to process grief as a community. Um, there's, there's a lot of things that are like this. Um, you talk to God, you, you're, if you have diagos blavish, you talk about it with others. That's what the Pasuk tells us to do. Um, it, the list goes on and on. That, that, that we, I think there's this false dichotomy that you find due to a secular influence that they see religiosity and mental health as this dichotomy, as that, that, that these things at odds. And we'll get to in a minute why people see it this way. But I just think, it's, first of all, just to see that there, in order to have a wholesome level of mental health, you need to address the needs of the mind, of the body, and of the soul. And so let's just break that down for a minute. Um, um, so the body is exercise, healthy dieting, balanced eating in moderation, sleep, um, you know, physical relaxation, etc. So those are those are ways if we engaging those in all those things on a daily basis, you know, cardio and muscle, um, etc. So those are all physical ways that we improve and though and that will interact with our mental health and that also interact with our spiritual health, but that is one of the three pillars that we require to have this wholesome healthiness. The second piece of what, what, what is required is not just to have the physical, but also to have emotional. So that means social needs. That m- means having love, respect, etc., trust. All these things are kind of like our, our emotional nutrition to um, ha- be a healthy, also person. And then there are spiritual needs. That means being feeling connected to God. That means feeling connected to our spirit, to be attuned to our intuition, not, not just our, our intuition that's in, aligned with um, our spirit with our good conscience, etc. So when we when we're, we feel that connection, the degree that we are connected to Hashem, to to spirituality, etc., that will fulfill. That will give us that spiritual nutrition. So we need to give ourselves physical, emotional, and that spiritual nutrition, and all those three things will make us a whole, healthy, wholesome person. So we have all three, right? When you daven, when you when you learn Torah. When you're engaging in in, in emuna bitachon, those are all things that will give you that spiritual nutrition. But also emuna bitachon also helps for your emotional nutrition because it makes you feel one of your things that you need your emotional needs is to feel safe and secure. And if you have a true sense of bitachon, that is what you will experience: the sense of safety and security from an all powerful being who has only your best interests at heart, is constantly supervising and arranging your life for your best benefit. Right? What can make you more happy, more secure? than that. Um, a sense of community, davening, etc. All these things, they all can make you more connected spiritually, but then those carry over to emotional things. And, and we all know that there's studies that show physical exercise, you know, getting good sleep, those things also improve not just your physical health, which they do, they also improve your emotional health. And also I think will motivate you to maybe perhaps, you know, move to your spiritual health. And I think the key point is not to get stuck in any one of these one things. If you find that you're only taking care of your spiritual health, you're not addressing your emotional and physical health as much, then you should focus on those factors. You need to achieve balance between your mind, your body, and your spirit. And the Torah helps for that, again, because by amplifying your addressing of your spiritual needs, that will then have carryover effects to your physical and emotional. And I think it's very important. We all have to be very honest with ourselves. You know, I know a lot of people that sometimes they just focus on their emotional health or, you know, they're always in therapy. The only conversations they have, maybe I'm a little guilty of this, right? There's always thinking about the newest philosophical psychology idea and, and the, you know, the newest uh, tweaking of that piece. And what they really need to do is hit the gym, you know, really, you know, either overweight or whatever it is. And that's a really important piece that we're trying to achieve this balance. 
Um, and then some people, you know, they're very religious, you know, they're going to shul, they're going, they're learning a lot of Torah, they're doing all these things, but really what they need to be doing is, you know, talking through some of their problems or maybe hitting the gym. And some people, the only thing they do is hit the gym and like they're, they're really strong, they're empowered, they go to fighting classes, they're yoga, stretching, cardio, muscle, they really have the full package, <laughs> you know, not pun intended. But they, they, but then what they're missing is this ability to, um, to uh, focus on maybe talk, you know, go address their core challenges. You know, their willingness to go deep, to go in, to, to enter the internal world, or to to address the spiritual or religious elements of their life that that have neglected. So we have to achieve balance here. And so my point here is that Torah doesn't is not a something you're trying to balance. Is not something that pulls you away from it. It could pull you away in terms of focus, but ultimately the Torah and anything spiritual, religious will contribute to your mental health, to your physical health, etc. And that's really important for us to keep in mind. So I would also like to address, I think it's just the elephant in the room, which is why does the world see religiosity and spirituality many times as that they are going against our um, our physical health, our emotional health? How come they see it in this light? So I think that there are a few controversial items that people do not address. So for example, I think one item is the item of anger, right? So in, in, in Judaism, right, we don't we say, if you get angry, it's like Avodah Zarah. It's like idol worship. So I think that people can be rightfully say that, you know, the Judaism denies anger. It's trying to tell you to repress it. So I would like to offer you my view of how I see this, my integration of my psychology background with my Torah background of Linton Yeshivas and Tomo and the mirror. So I, I have a true appreciation for the religious perspective on this. So let me offer you my, my view of this um, way to balance um, anger with our Yiddishkeit. So the way I would see it is as follows, that there's... I'll break it down to three steps. When you get angry, there's three things. There's that flash of anger. And this anger you could feel is nonsensical. This is an anger you could fall on the street and, and, you're, and you get angry at the sidewalk, right? That's, that can be an anger. That's that original flash of anger. And then you're like, wait, it's a sidewalk. I can't be angry at it. And then you, that anger doesn't get a chance to fester. It doesn't get a chance to accumulate to, to, uh, you know, to join up. Like a, it doesn't get a chance to snowball. There's that flash of anger, then there's the brewing, and then you stew in it, and then you allow it to stay inside of you, and it festers and it grows. And then there's a point where it becomes entrenched. And then that anger is something um, that becomes almost like a part of you, and something that you don't want to give up. It becomes something that you could always reach for, and that anger is still there. And we have many of those things in our lives, for different things that hurt us, you know, for directly, indirectly, etc., so I think the, the position of Yiddishkeit would be as follows, that when you first experience that anger, that immediate flash of anger, that's not the anger that the Torah is talking about. That's, some, that's a very human response to any situation. You feel right any, any pain, you feel anger, this, you immediately get anger. Maybe anger is a defense, it's a secondary emotion. However you want to understand it, there's that flash of anger and that the Torah is not going to your human being and that's not something the Torah expects you to never feel. Okay, and then there's step three, that once the anger becomes festers and it becomes entrenched with inside of you, then it, just like Daigos Belevish Yisichena, that just as fears that, become, that enter your heart, you need to talk them out. I think anger does as well. Anger, you need to give your, yourself a chance to feel anger, to be angry. Now, how exactly you express that anger and who you say that anger to, etc. There are rules in Yiddishkeit for how to go about that in a, a healthy way, not just emotionally, but a healthy way spiritually. You're not causing too much destruction to yourself or others, violating your own value systems. So there are rules of how to do that. But the point is, I think at that point, the anger needs to have it get its respect, not just in, to be communicate your, your respect to it and with words, but also, I think, to f- allow yourself to feel angry and to talk out your anger with um, someone, you know, a therapist, a life coach, with me, whoever, whoever you, a mentor, whatever, whoever it is, a loved one. So I think then there's this middle phase though, right? There's the flash of anger, then there's the anger already being entrenched, and there's this middle phase where you're stewing in this anger, and you're deciding, is this anger worthwhile, really? And you're saying, why did this person cut me off in traffic? They shouldn't have done this to me. I'm running late also. Doesn't everyone has a life? You have to be respectful. And you sit there and stew in it, right? Why did my boss yell at me? He shouldn't have done that. He doesn't even appreciate who I am and what I do for the team, and he doesn't. So that stewing phase, I think that's where Yiddish wants us to fight. 
And I think that the, honestly, I think the therapy, the psychological world has become too permissive for anger. And their job is, they just want a person who many times has not given them permission to ever experience anger. They're just telling them, feel angry, and they're trying to correct an imbalance. And many of these people, they don't feel empowered enough. To, they don't have access to their anger. And that is something that I think is really important. It's crit- really critical, and therapists are doing a great service to their clients by giving them access to it. But I think the way you give access needs to be more nuanced. It's not trying to tell you that anger is always good. Anger, that you every, every time you feel angry, you better let them know. I think there's this middle ground of the flash of anger, that's gonna, inevitable. The anger becoming entrenched, once it's entrenched, to release it. But that middle ground, to use spiritual principles, you know, Hashem would have said, if Hashem wanted me to have this pain, it would have happened from this person or someone else. You know, next time I'll, I'll create boundaries. But you know what? Maybe it was a little bit my fault, the fact that I, I kind of walked myself, I walk, kind of walked into that pole, so to speak. I, I kind of walked into that problem. You know, and trying to find different ways, not necessarily to say what that person did was right, but just to, it's different ways to calm your anger and not allow it to get entrenched inside of you. And then for demanding this sense of vengeance or, or reprisal over this foe, you know, real or imagined. Or this person didn't mean it. It wasn't malevolent. It wasn't personal. You know, there are a thousand ways we could fight this anger. And I think some of it will require, again, this is how Torah can help us by giving us different perspectives of Amun and Bitachon. That this ing- this pain would have happened to me anyway, etc. Hashem is doing it for my good, so that can help diffuse a lot of that anger before it becomes entrenched. And that way, I think this is my approach towards diffusing some of the tension some may feel between Torah and therapy. I think another piece to this is lush and horror, right? And you'll find like hyper religious, you know, some pe- clients who suffer from excessive scrup- scrupulosity, which is like excessive. They do stringencies that go beyond the boundaries of what the Torah demands or even requests or or even sees as an ideal. I think that there's a sense that um, that a person has to when they're when they're dealing with their their lashon hara that, that, that they don't want to share things in therapy. I don't want to say anything bad of my parents. You know, you have to be respectful to your parents. It's it's lashon hara to say anything or Lashon to say something bad about anyone. So, and there is, an, that is an important ideal. So how do we balance that with therapy, which is kind of the whole thing of therapy is to kind of let out a lot of our negativity. So how do we bridge this gap? So it's interesting. If you look in Halacha, there is a concept called Toelis, constructive intent. So this, I think this particular um, conflict is mostly imagined because the Torah itself acknowledges, right, that if a person has a, a, a constructive benefit towards sharing negative information, depending on the circumstance, they're either allowed to or sometimes even obligated to share information, right? If you know something bad, uh, there's going to be a partnership or one of them is a scammer, you are not allowed to sit on that information and say, you know what, they'll find out one way or another. You're not allowed to sit on that information. It's not just permitted for you to share that information. You'd be obligated to share that with that potential customer. So in, when it comes to therapy, therapy is definitely a toelis to make yourself a, a mentally healthy, healthy person who's then able to fulfill God's will in this world, to connect to God, to your fellow man, to support a family, etc. So becoming that healthy person is a very strong toelis. Maybe that'd be the most constructive benefit. Biggest constructive benefit would be, most profound constructive benefit would be to achieve that. However, I do think that this value of not saying negativity towards others is not just valuable outside of therapy. I think it's valuable within therapy. Because sometimes, even within the therapeutic context, there is a sense that you have to justify negativity. If you sense the person is turning to negativity in a way that is self, out of self-sabotage, or in a way that they're just looping around in this negativity, they're wallowing, and they're not, they're not processing it anymore, or they already processed it, or they're, they kind of enjoy kind of sitting in this mud, um, and, and or, it's, or they use it as a distraction from addressing more core negativities. I think understanding that when, even within the therapeutic context, the therapist needs to be, an, or coach, in a life coaching session, needs to be very attuned to how much is, is this, does this negativity justify its cost? And it does have a cost. You know, even when it's constructive, there is a cost to it. It just, sometimes that cost is worth it to let it out. With the process, which is necessary for trauma, which is necessary for getting over entrenched negativity that, that, we, that you know, again, that we referred to earlier. So I think it's really important for us to, to process things. But it, that, so the therapist needs to be attuned to this balance of, of, yes, releasing negativity, to processing negativity, learning the lessons of negativity, not repressing the client from it. 
But when the client is is looping and wallowing and sorry, that where there is a constructive benefit, that is an area where I think a therapist would be very, it would be very positive to ensure that the, in order that the relationship doesn't become too negative, in order that to show, ensure that the client is moving forward and not just justify everything under this blanket exception called therapy, but to actually be selective in, into when this, you know, when this should be applied. Again, you have to assume that the the value systems are aligned, etc. But if they are, I do think that I don't think lashon hara should be something that's just cast out of the of of therapy and just say this is just something that's religious and you know when all therapy is toalas, it's not. Not all therapy is toalas, and some some people in coaching or therapy, the coach or therapy can do damage. I think excessive lashon hara, I think, can be where it's not doesn't have that constructive benefit. It cannot just be constructive; it could be destructive. And I think so. I just think this is something again where it's not Yiddish kind and therapy are not. Um, not aligned, but I think actually a therapist can take notes from what the Torah, how the Torah wants Lashon Hara only to be used very selectively. Um, and I think that's something that's really important. So we addressed anger, we addressed, um, addressed um, Lashon Hara. I think uh, just one other point where I think people see um, is where they see therapy and religion going against each other and the Torah going against each other is regarding shame and judgment that the Torah says it's an Avera and you'll go to Gehenna and all these things. And people think what these things mean is that you're going to, um, you know, if you don't, you're supposed to see other people as a Russia and stay away from Rishon or evildoers. So how do we reconcile this? This seems seemingly dichotomy between people that, um, that are engaged in, in therapy that they, they, their judgment and shame are many times they have too much of it. So isn't it correct to try to kind of cast off this burden, this yoke of shame and judgment that seems to be their, their religion kind of um, imposed upon them, um, demanded of them. So I'll tell you what, how I see it. Um, shame, like any other midah, right? We know that the word midah, comes from the, the Lashon, the language, uh, the etymology of the word comes from the same etymology as Mida of a measurement. Every trait, including shame, is good in the right dose and the right context. Every part of a person, God, Hashem gave it to us for our good. It's meant to help us. It is a blessing. It is a good thing. It's like getting a knife set for a wedding present. Yes, that can be used to stab people and could cause minors tremendous harm if they don't know how to use it. You know, God forbid, but but it's a present. Yes, it can be misused, but it's a present. Every part of us is, simil- is, is similarly um, a present from Hashem in the same way, it, to be used in the right dose, in the right context, as Hashem intended. You don't know how it's supposed to be used? We got a book. It's called the Torah. That's how you're supposed to use it. If you're not really not sure from the book, ask the rabbi, you know, a local, competent, local, orthodox, you know, Talmud Chacham, scholar who's about Midos, etc., so what, what I think over here, what we really need to do is to understand that shame is a good part of us. And just like any good part of us, it can also be used for bad. It can, in the right, in too little or too much of it, in the wrong context, can cause damage, right? A person's self-esteem, if you're too high self-esteem, it's called arrogance, right? If you have um, kindness, kindness is great. No, unless if, if you're kind to people who are evil, that's not a positive thing, right? Everything, even good things, good traits, need to be reined in as well. Good predispositions. You know, Chazal tell us that we're supposed to serve Hashem bishnei Yitzrecha. We have a part of us that's predisposed to do good and predisposed to do um, towards our e- good traits and evil traits. And both both sides need to be reined in and need to be channeled and led by us, by our internal leadership, to be used in the right dose, in the right context, within the context, within aligned and in fully in sync with Hashem's will. So I just think that when we're dealing with shame, in many times in therapy, there are parts of us and there's a certain sense of overly judgment, right? We say we can have a shame of our very existence. I don't deserve to exist. That shame is unwarranted and that shame is not a good shame, right? That's a shame. If you feel shame because you you did something bad, right? You did an, an Avera, that's a, good, that's a good thing to feel because that shame will help correct you and it'll help bring you back to a better place and it will help you take make you be proactive to avoid putting yourself in, in, in negative situations. Put, avoid putting yourself in, um, in, in situations of, of access to temptation 
or passion, etc. So I think that shame will guide us toward being proactive and taking necessary precautions to ensure that we won't be um, violating our own internal values and systems. So that is the purpose of shame, and we should use it as such. So if we feel shame for what we did, for a bad action, that's warranted up to a point. If you're, if you're sitting and looping around in that all day for many days and you're, you're calling yourself all, all sorts of bad names, like you jerk, you fool, you this and that. No, 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 you don't call yourself mean, mean things. But if you're feeling honest, forget, you know, I really could have overcome it and I didn't. I feel bad about that. That's positive. And that's something that's very healthy in therapy. And I think that can be channeled. And it's also true that many people who go to therapy have excessive shame and shame has become weaponized by, by you know, their evil spirit or whatever, however you want to conceptualize that, that they're, they're, they're of a sense of imbalance, they have too much shame. And that can be the therapist's role you know, or, or coach's role to help dilute or reduce that level of shame. But the goal isn't to eliminate it. Just like there's no if trying to exile or eliminate any part of yourself is not healthy, it's not wholesome. The same applies to shame. And shame is, a very, is one of our most powerful self-protective mechanisms that we have to ensure that we don't violate our values. You should communicate positive things to your shame. Now, when the shame tries to beat up on you too much, it needs to be reined in, right? So if it shames you for who you are, for what you are, for, you know, you know, for your very essence, you know, I don't, you know, I don't deserve to exist. I don't, I don't, you know, I'm a loser. Those types of things where you kind of give yourself a, a blanket, na- a blanket, uh, blanket negative l- label, that's negative. That's, that's not what's the purpose of shame. Shame is meant to ensure that you protect your value systems. So you're supposed to feel some punishment for what you did, and that's what shame does, and it helps guide you towards action. And now, if it's not guiding you towards action, it's guiding you towards paralysis, if it's guiding you towards just feeling down in the dumps and, and, depress, and depressive about it, that, that means you're not using shame the way it's intended. Now, if, you're not, if you do something wrong and you're feeling totally fine about it, and you're like, oh, this is just who I am, and this is what it is, I'm just human, that's not healthy either. You know, so I think we need to find the right balance for this. And I think Yiddish guy well, can help us with that. I don't see it as an obstacle. I think some people, right, the confusion I think occurs with anger, with fear, with shame, all these things that we're discussing here, Lashon Hara, is usually when people are, you, in the name of religion, are, 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 are not using it the way it was meant to. They're not saying it in the way that it's meant to be said. So I think that we have to be really careful. I think just, again, so let's do a quick recap, right? We're saying that Torah comes first, right? Therapy comes second in, t- in the terms of the prioritization. However, there is a certain sense that therapy comes first, that the, Hashem, the Torah assumes that we are a certain degree of healthy people, a healthy self-love, a healthy self-esteem, a healthy um, level of joy in our lives, you know? So that's, that's number two. Point number three is that the Torah doesn't just not take away from it, it can add to it. It adds to it through giving us a sense of community, of connection, of processing what we did wrong, of da'i goes blavish yesichana. You're supposed to talk out your anxieties. It's, it's, it's in their sense of so many things that we do in Yiddishkeit, of prayer, of meditation, of bitachon, of, of giving a sense of, of security, of, of safety, of calm, um, of feeling this love towards ourselves, our fellow man, and God. I think it gives us so much positivity and re- religious resilience. Um, so I think that Torah doesn't just not detract from it. It adds to it if it's done in the correct way. Um, so not, it, it adds to it and overlaps. And then again, some people can be missing parts of their mind, some body and some soul, right? Uh, mind, body, soul. So some, you, know, you have to address your emotional needs and cognitive needs. You can address your physical needs and spiritual and religious needs. So I think if you address each of these um, separately, right, a person can still live in a state of misery and unhealthiness. The goal is to address each one individually. And yes, therapy is primarily geared towards your cognitive and emotional health. But I think that a person that you, you're able to then address your, your um, they all influence each other. So I think if you focus on your Torah health, it influences your emotional health and physical health. And I would just say some things within Yiddishkeit directly engage with your emotional and physical health, right? So I think that's also something that's very important to understand. And we just addressed three confusions that people have regarding this and where they see it, Torah and psychology as an economy regarding anger. And we broke it down to three steps. The first step is inevitable, that flash of anger. The last step of it being entrenched once it's entrenched, that needs to be released in a healthy way right? within Torah values. Yes, that, that is a healthy thing to do, and that's a good thing to do, and therapy should allow for that. 
And, and then there's this middle step where a person could use Torah ideas or emotional ideas, etc., cognitive, you know, CBT, whatever you want to use in order to um, make sure, ensure that your anger doesn't become entrenched inside of you. And that's where I think the Torah wants us to fight that battlefield. And yes, a person who doesn't have access to anger needs to, through psychology, to gain access to it, etc. But the point is, anger is not just all good and it's not all evil. We need to find this balance. And then we said regarding shame that, again, shame is good in the right dose and context. We need to focus it on what we do, not who we are. Um, not to feel too much of it, not to not also to feel too little, again, is unhealthy thing. And shame is a big blessing from God. It's meant to use as is intended and not to be abused for um, just feeling depressed, etc. Um, or ignored. And then we said, so that was anger. Um, and we said, and then Lashon Hara, again, Lashon Hara is something that we should say things with Toelas. And we should also... Um, we should we should ensure that every th- every all negativity within the therapeutic context is being um, monitored and being sure that it's being used for constructive benefit. And we're not just saying it because that's what feels good and um, etc. And, and there is a toalas of therapy for sure. If it's for a therapeutic benefit to share something, for sure, you person should. And yes, that should be encouraged. However, it should also be monitored to ensure that a person's not just wallowing or looping around the negativity and not making any progress, not processing anything. So then in that case, the therapy should ste- step in and ensure that the person should be moving towards um, processing something negative, not just saying Lashon Hara for the sake of negativity. And no, it's a safe space, so now you should share anything. No, it, it should be monitored and um, something that we should jump in at the wrong time. Let me know your thoughts about this. Please find me at coachbensonfox.com. If any of this resonated with you, if you're looking to find better joy, balance, or growth in your physical health, emotional health, spiritual health, I think I, I, if I'm the right person for you, let's see if I can help you in any way. Go to coachbensonfox.com, C-O-O-A-C-H-B-E-N-S-O-N-F-O-X.com, uh, coachbensonfox.com, um, and you could sign up for a free session. Um, I, I don't want you to sign up to anything unless you feel comfortable with me, so we'll have a free session. We'll see in that free consultation how we could best help you. Um, okay, Clarity, you could see other professionals as well if you think they may be a better fit. But um, go to coachbensonfox.com. A pleasure being with you here today, guys. I really hope you guys benefited from this. Um, let me know your thoughts. You could email me results at coachbensonfox.com. Results with a plural at coachbensonfox.com. If you have any comments or questions about this or, or on Instagram itself, you could, um, my handle is coachbensonfox. Feel free to do so. Um, it's really a pleasure being with you here tonight, tonight guys. Um, and, um, hopefully I'll, I'll have a chance to do this again in the future. All the best.